So I'd like to start by introducing our first speaker, our first invited speaker. It's Cheryl Hetkevich, and the program actually has the, a, a short bio or short profile, and so I'll read it from you, for you. So Cheryl is an associate conservation scientist at Wildlife Conservation Society Canada, and she's working to progress research and monitoring of boreal ecology in the face of climate change, landscape fragmentation, and resource extraction. Her work has included developing wildlife corridors, monitoring mammal population, and organizing community-based mammal management strategies. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, in terms of her uh, academic formation, so she got a, a bachelor's degree from the University of Alberta, uh, then obtained a master's in animal productivity from University of Alaska at Fairbanks, and then returned to the University of Alberta where she got her PhD in 2008. And so today, Cheryl will talk, or will present a talk, entitled, Planning to Conserve North America's Most Intact Wetlands and Peatlands. Cheryl? Thank you. First of all, can everybody hear me okay? <clears throat> Great, so it's a real pleasure to be here to talk to you and take this opportunity to introduce you to a place that probably most of you, maybe some of you have been to, but hopefully all of you will get to at some point in your lifetime. Um, I want to acknowledge my co-author Anastasia Littner with Littner Law, who helped write the report, some of which I'm going to be talking about today, um, as well as our funders, the W. Garfield Western Foundation that supports our work with WCS Canada. Just by way of introduction in terms of outline, I'm going to introduce you to this part of Ontario where many people have, may have heard about but haven't actually been to, talk about some of the global and provincial conservation context for what's going on there, talk about some of the threats and then how we're planning to conserve and develop that landscape and what things may be needed in making sure that some of these regions are, are looked, looked after in the future. So where is Ontario's far north? Um, Ontario's far north is really this area that's north of sort of 51 degrees. This line is not an ecological line, it's really a planning line. That's where commercial forestry officially ends in Ontario. This is the area of undertaking, so all this area is actually divvied up into forest management planning areas. And the far north is this large um, subarctic environment that exists north of that line. It's 42% of Ontario, and it consists of two very large different ecozones, the Boreal Shield on, in the west and the Hudson's Bay Lowlands in the, in the east. What's unique about this space is it's the largest intact boreal forest left on the planet. Together with Manitoba and portions of Quebec, this represents the largest uh, extant piece of, of forest in the world. It's also, sorry, I didn't need to point that out, obviously. It's also an area where we've had limited industrial footprint over you know, its development as well as currently in this future, uh, as well as currently. And this is just another way of looking at that. So we're really looking at this, this massive space up here on the edges of the Hudson's Bay and James Bay. So largely intact landscapes like what Ontario's far north are very rare. The northern landscape, in, as I mentioned, in terms of boreal forest is, you know, Canada has 54% of the world's boreal forest and a third of that is actually in northern Ontario. In terms of river systems, three of the largest of Canada's rivers actually run through this region and three others are actually contained within that system. In terms of peatlands, this is the second largest global uh, peatland complex in the world. Um, and these complexes, as then most of you might know, are actually really important for carbon storage and regulation as well as climate regulation. And the estimates, certainly for the peatlands in the far north, is that they offset and sequester at least a third of Ontario's carbon emissions. And the last big um, intact watershed or intact landscape there are the wetlands. Um, these wetlands are a significant uh, significantly important for a number of species, but also really important as well in terms of carbon and, and climate regulation. These environments hold a number of important habitats for some of the species that 
we probably don't think about daily but are an important place or an important stronghold for species that are in decline all over the world in particular in Ontario. Um, 53 mammals that have moved into this landscape after the Ice Age uh, 8 to 10,000 years ago still live in this environment. We have the most southerly population of polar bears left in the world. There are at least 900. Uh, we have the most, um, a, a very threatened endangered ecotype of uh, boreal caribou. There are about 3,000 of these uh, caribou moving through the boreal forest. And we're also responsible for the most westerly popu or easterly population of wolverine. All of these species are species at risk and considered threatened within Ontario as well as across North America. Most of these species are in decline. <coughs> we have some of the most intact watersheds in North America. We're looking at this green yellow space, which means that they've been unimpacted by human development. Um, five of the 12 remaining undammed, unregulated watersheds exist um, in this region. And that creates, that creates uh, a variety of aquatic habitats for, for habitats for a number of freshwater fish. In fact, there are about 50 species of freshwater fish in the far north. It's a biodiversity hotspot for cold water freshwater fish. And it's again experienced some of the least amount of human alteration in natural landscapes. The far north in particular around the James Bay and Hudson's Bay coasts is one of the few places where we still see massive migrations of shorebirds and waterfowl. And these mudflats and regions around the James Bay and Hudson's Bay are actually really important for birds migrating up from, from the St. Lawrence, as well as Mexico and other parts of uh, southern, southern, uh, southern Americas on their way up to Arctic breeding grounds in the far north, in the true far north, I guess. And these are some of the examples of the, the endangered red knot, which is a significant shorebird, as well as um, the snow goose, which is an important waterfowl. The boreal forest itself is also a really important nesting and nursery habitat for a number of migratory neotropical birds. And Ontario holds a, a global responsibility for at least 150 species. Just to put again this in perspective, we have some of the densest um, um, peatlands left in, on the planet. 25% of the world's peatlands occur in Canada. Um, peatlands are very slow growing, delicate systems. They consist of semi-decomposed biomass that have taken millennia to, to develop. And you can see there's a huge concentration of these peatland systems in the far north. The Ramsar Convention on Wetlands has identified two important uh, wetland types here. One is the Polar Bear Park, which is around there, and the other is the James Bay, the James Bay Wetlands. And so together with the wetlands, James Bay and Hudson's Bay, Ontario's peatlands hold as much water as Lake Erie, and they store more carbon than any other ecosystems in Ontario and probably in the world. Because conservation has failed to sort of build on the moral imperative to look after our environment and care for the species and things that happen there. We've shifted our conversations to things called ecosystem services and put them into a variety of different categories. So provisioning services are ways of thinking about environment that provide fuel, food, fiber, genetic resources, fresh water, regulating systems like climate regulation, systems that are providing air quality, water control, uh, erosion control, uh, climate regulation. And the slow movement of certainly the water through the lakes, wetlands, rivers, and peatlands in the far north are fundamental to these kinds of regulating systems. And I'll move into a little bit about the people that live there, but this is also an important place for people who need, who need food, who need fuel, and who live in these systems directly. That all to say is that there's been a number of efforts by larger conservation organizations, including our, our own, to highlight what's special about the boreal forest and why this area needs much more protection and consideration with respect to development than maybe other places in the world, such as tropical systems. So moving into the people that live there, <clears throat> I take Thomas Burgess quote at the top here. We often sitting in our comfortable homes, usually even where I am in Thunder Bay, I'm still not in the far north. Think about this as being the frontier, the next big place where we're you know, on the edge of something different. 
But for many people, particularly First Nations, this has been their home for millennia. And most of that um, interaction with our culture has really just emerged in the last two to 300 years. In the far north in particular, um, ooh, sorry, when the English and the French arrived into this part of the region looking for essentially furs to support the fur industry in, in Europe at the time, they saw this place as pretty barren and devoid of, of life and not very interesting. But it ended up eventually with a series of fur trading posts all across Canada. And most of us are aware of this history of movement of our culture across, across Canada to the point where, um, where we are today is a series of different agreements between federal and provincial governments uh, as well as territorial governments about how how land is managed and who gets to decide what happens in that land. So in the far north, we're looking at a, a treaty situation where communities are under uh, an obligation to not surrender their, their land, but essentially surrender um, some of the aspects of using their land for, for reservation situations. What does it look like today? Well, the terminology that we use today is this is a social ecological system. These are people embedded in the ecology and the ecosystems in that land. There are about 34,000 Cree and Ojibwe, Oji Cree people who've inherited a legacy of a relationship with both our provincial and federal government, but also a relationship with the land. They are linked to the outside world uh, primarily through winter roads in the winter and then through air. These are remote communities, there's about 34 of them and they remain still very close to that environment. That said, there are a lot of issues with communities, particularly in these remote situations. Most of you may have heard about some of the challenges for communities trying to not only um, access and use the land in different ways, but also dealing with a number of social issues from, from a young population that's exploding to a number of social issues around drugs, alcohol, and suicide. Makes it a very complicated place to, to try and do work. At the same time, there is commitments to bringing First Nations into planning processes that help decide what the future is going to be on this land, whether it's through land use planning as, a, as up here or through deciding what happens with respect to development. So what are the economic drivers on this landscape? Most of our land uses are focused on non-renewables, focused on mining. Uh, this area here is the Ring of Fire. I'm going to talk about that in a little bit um, in a few minutes but we have an existing diamond mine, the Victor Diamond Mine, out near Adawapaskat in the Hudson's Bay Lowlands, and a gold mine, the Muscle White Mine, over in the Shield Country. This gives you an example of the winter roads. This is the only time that there might be any real infrastructure on the landscape. These obviously disappear when, when the ice goes out. Sorry, this is just an example of a mineral exploration camp. These can anywhere, be from anywhere from 50 to 100 people living on the land 24-7. Um, doing sampling and collecting data around geology. Um, there's a limited amount of forestry, industrial forestry in the landscape. It's a subarctic environment, maybe six to seven percent of the forest is actually commercially viable. It turns out to be a very small band across just north of this uh, AOU line or the far north planning line. And every single river has been scoped for some kind of hydro potential um, there's real interest in for communities to be engaged in run of the river hydro, which supports local um, energy production, but most of the interests around mining and fueling industrial development will rely on the development of much more industrial um, hydro, hydro plants at some level. So what is the ring of fire? Uh, maybe unless you've been living under a rock, it's very difficult to avoid um, a conversation about what's going on in the ring of fire. It's essentially an arc-shaped uh, area of mineralization which has caught the attention of a number of, of mineral development companies as well as mining companies. It's remote. It's right on the edge of the, it's on the ecotone essentially between the, the shield and the wetlands. And there are a number of uh, claims that have been staked in this area to supply some kind of infrastructure corridor to get to these mines. It's 534 kilometers north of Thunder Bay. So Thunder Bay is down here, <coughs> Great Lake, Lake Superior is here. 
it's, it's quite, it's incredibly remote. So anybody that's done work in the Arctic around industrial development as well, it's a very similar scenario as what we're seeing in Nunavut, as what we're seeing in portions of the Yukon Territory as well as the Northwest Territories. But it's a world-class um, chromite deposit, and there's also world-class deposits of nickel. Um, most of the Ring of Fire was founded because um, De Beers and its work was going across here looking for diamonds and hit on a number of other deposits associated with this development. A beautiful map. I don't expect you to read it, but there are at least 30 other mining companies um, with claims in these areas just waiting essentially for road access. So in thinking about the future, um, the first, first road in will lead to probably much more development in this region going forward. In keeping with the human uh, type impacts on the landscape, climate change is, is, is probably most under, <laughs> underrepresented and under, under misunderstood in some, certainly in our thinking around uh, land use planning. This is the, um, the winter projections for climate change in the Far North uh, that came out of the Far North Science Advisory Panel report in 2010. And it predicts much higher winter temperatures than we're used to much drier summers and exacerbation of fire, particularly on the shield, uh, which is a, you know, a fire-driven system, but certainly has the potential to increase that fire regime, um, and also has implications for drying out of wetlands and permaf um, wetlands, peatlands, and in permafrost. Um, the reason these climate change projections are important is because they have not been applied very well in thinking about planning. And at the same time, we're already seeing impacts associated with climate change, both from polar bear biology, uh, quality, uh, the body condition of polar bears is in decline for that, northern, uh, for that southern Hudson Bay population, as well as fairly regular um, emergency crisis associated with communities, either evacuating because of forest fires or evacuating because of extreme flooding, uh, flooding events. All this to say, we don't have any official formal protection. The formal protection on wetlands and peatlands in the far north is zero. Um, the provincial park, I will admit, is, is there, but it's very small compared to what we know about peatlands and wetlands in terms of extent. Um, but there are things coming along uh, that have opportunity to try and change some of that scenario. In terms of a history of planning, um, it goes back to sort of the 1980s. Most planning has evolved in terms of conflict between First Nations government and industry. Um, anybody that's interested can look back at the Royal Commission on the Northern Environment that evolved in the 1980s in part because of concerns by First Nations about the development or the sale of the last large intact uh, boreal forest to a company, a forestry company that had been responsible for poisoning with mercury, most of the English and Wabagon river systems. This led to the development of the West Patricia Land Use Plan, which one of the recommendations that came out of the Royal Commission was that this plan should not go forward because it was a top-down um, approach to planning and it did not include the, the local communities or the people. And it also didn't really address the environmental assessment concerns of most of those in communities. Um, it wasn't till 2000 that forestry really came back to the forefront. There were communities that were interested in trying to access forestry and being part of the forestry management planning process that was, was viable and lucrative uh, south of that uh, planning line. Um, so the government created a planning initiative with a number of communities to try to look at how to increase management planning with First Nations um, through the Nor Northern Boreal Initiative. Change of government, change of scene, um, change of priorities. In 2008, the McGuinty government made a commitment to the Far North. It was couched in the terms of opening up the Far North for development. This was part of a larger economic plan that was going forward at the time throughout Ontario. But the key piece around opening up the Far North was a commitment to protection of at least 225,000 kilometers squared. That's an area the size of the United Kingdom and there were key commitments to ensuring that some of the processes that create, that made the Far North what it was, were also going to be conserved in this approach. And the last two objectives of, of that planning commitment was that First Nations would be involved. 
and have to be engaged if they wanted to be, um, and that sustainable development was the, was the mode for going forward around development. So this is a busy slide, but under the Far North Act, there are two sort of branches in which this planning and conservation unfolds. One is with community-based planning with uh, interested communities. They get to decide on their landscape what area gets protected, what area gets developed, and what area might be important for more enhanced or management action. These kinds of designations and the zoning approach comes from Ontario's provincial planning processes elsewhere, including, including Waterloo and other areas throughout the southern portion of Ontario. And the last piece, which is something that we're very interested in as an organization, is the Far North Land Use Strategy. This is the piece that apparently speaks to regional scale processes. So if anywhere is going to be looking at large sort of protected areas around peatlands or conserving processes that make sure those peatlands and wetlands exist, it's going to be in this Far North Land Use Strategy. So what does community-based land use planning look like? Well, these are all the community plans that have emerged so far. It's essentially a knitting together of community zones as they've emerged as communities are interested in planning. So it's not quite, maybe not quite clearly see it, but there's, 30, there's 31 of these. We're going to end up with a knitted together patchwork of community plans throughout the whole far north, all of which will have some measure of protected areas, some amount of development, some amount of enhanced management areas. The other component of this is that um, even though development can't really proceed until a land use plan is in place, there are exemptions um, and there are opportunities for planning for development to continue um, even though community-based plans are not in place. And that's of relevance mainly because this area is the ring of fire, these communities are still slowly getting together and deciding what they want to do in their territories. I will just say too, in looking at these plans, these are all plans that are based on trap lines. So they're very interesting and maybe useful from a terrestrial perspective, but even for communities that have, you know, the, the aquatic systems are not only their transportation systems, but their play, the water is a really significant component of most of these First Nation um, histories, culture, value, um, and ideas. And so what we're looking at is a very terrestrial based approach to thinking about planning and conservation, which has real implications for aquatic systems. The regional planning advice, um, the Ministry of Natural Resources in particular, struck a number of committees to help give it some advice on how to do regional planning. Uh, the science for a changing far north is the scientist um, at input into thinking about what needs to be done. Um, these are some of the main recommendations that came out of that, out of that report, and I won't go into too much, but it was really about trying to promote the need to highlight and, and support conservation for things like peatlands and wetlands and emphasize that cumulative effects of development were going to be some of the key challenges to a planning approach if it was going to be done piecemeal or project by project. None of these recommendations have been taken up by the government. The other person that's really important in terms of trying to promote um, and look at what government is doing in terms of planning is the Environmental Commissioner of, the, of Ontario. And the Environmental Commissioner of Ontario, or the ECO, has also raised concerns about the ability to do regional planning, regional scale monitoring, regional scale conservation, particularly where it affects things like peatlands and wetlands. So how do we plan for development? There are two pieces of legislation, Ontario's Environmental Assessment Act and the um, Canadian Environmental Assessment Act. The Ontario EA is very interesting because it cares about the betterment of all people in Ontario. What does betterment mean? How do, how do proponents actually show that they're doing a better, uh, they're bettering the life of, of Ontario's, Ontarians? It's mainly through an economic argument. We're going to create jobs, we're going to support the economy, things will be better because our project goes forward. The Canadian Environmental Assessment Act is really about talking around what's significant. What are the significant adverse effects and can we show that these projects will have no significant adverse effects on the environment, therefore they should go forward. So there's some real differences in the way we think about these two, 
two types of planning, uh, two types of planning legislation that decide essentially what projects get to go forward in terms of development. Again, the analysis shows that these are really project by project assessments. They're really scoped by the proponent to actually include either pieces of their, their, their project or um, a, a certain scale around which their project is assessed for impacts. In Ontario, it also, their act doesn't apply to private projects. So mines in Ontario are not subject to individual environmental assessment. We really rely on the federal legislation to make sure that mining companies and mining projects are actually going through an environmental assessment. The other piece of, that's come through both in the literature but in terms of practice across Canada is the ability to address cumulative effects. So this is when you have, you know, you have a road, you have the pit, you have the climate change, you have another road next to it that hasn't been scoped in your project over time these multiple impacts come together in very unpredictable and nonlinear ways and they're very difficult to manage I agree but at the same time none of these processes really do a good job of addressing cumulative impacts. As a public, as somebody as an Ontario citizen, somebody that wants to be involved in decision making, your ability to have input into these processes is quite limited. If you think that you're part of the decision making process it's a bit of a challenge because in many cases things have been approved and things are going through a public consultation process but your ability to actually say no or ability to say why is this happening this way is actually quite limited. And the challenge in the far north is environmental assessment is not integrated with land use planning. So land use planning is happening with the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry. They're going along with their ideas about what should happen on the land. Environmental assessment is managed by the Ministry of the Environment and Climate Change and they, they talk to each other but they certainly don't in, implicate their projects <coughs> and planning processes uh, across the sy systems together. The other challenge with environmental assessment, and this is also clear in the literature, is that it creates real issues for ind indigenous peoples around the world, but First Nations in particular in the far north. Uh, this is just some headlines from the paper. Um, the Matawa communities, which are going to be the communities most directly affected by the Ring of Fire development, called a judicial review against the Canadian Environmental Assessment Agency as well as Cliffs Chromite Mine because they were not happy with the approach to environmental assessment, which was essentially a desktop study of the impacts and concerns of this project. They won their judicial review and went to a negotiated process, which now means the First Nations and the government are sitting down to come up with what is the appropriate environmental assessment process for this region. Um, most of those negotiations concern things like revenue sharing, uh, but they also include concerns about monitoring at the regional scale and an enhanced EA as opposed to a nice document. At the same time, we've had major changes to our federal environmental legislation. <coughs> and I won't go into all of these, but a number of omnibus budget bills were passed um, two years ago now, which essentially altered most of the legislation around Ontario's environmental, piece, uh, environmental legislation and affected the way the Ministry of, Re of Natural Resources and Forestry do business. Because of cuts and budget uh, constraints, Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry is in the business of getting out of the business. And so much of the oversight of our natural environment is really constrained. These budget bills do not have to go through public uh, commentary or consultation um, and many of us woke up the next day with changes to a variety of pieces of legislation that we had no awareness or understanding of at the time. This has also played out at the federal level. So the Fisheries Act is a really important, it's an old piece of legislation but it's a really important piece for trying to conserve habitat, particularly wet habitats that fish need to live in. Um, and it went again from overnight being um, protecting habitat for fish biodiversity to only considering fish that have commercial, recreational, or subsistence value. Uh, the entire Environmental Assessment Act was repealed and rewritten. That was one of the other outcomes of the, of the omnibus budget bill at the federal level. <coughs> 
And so many of the changes here are also problematic. It narrows the scope even further. It created a project list that you would not, you don't actually trigger an EA unless you're a certain size or a certain capacity of project. It retakes the screening of projects out of the hands of the regulatory agencies, so Environment Canada doesn't review these processes anymore. It's reviewed by the agency. And it also down, downstreams or offloads a lot of the uh, concerns or, or the processes around environmental assessment to the province. This is Bob Gibson, one of your uh, distinguished faculty members here, who wrote quite a few comments on on EA and has spent a lot of time sort of trying to, s trying to understand and to promote uh, environmental assessment processes that do a much better job of conserving the environment as opposed to making things easier for industry. The other piece I'll just mention because it's tied to water and tied to wetlands and, and lakes and rivers is the Navigation Protection Act. Again, overnight, we went from having 2.5 million rivers and lakes uh, protected under this piece of legislation to a list that includes 97 lakes, 62 rivers, and three oceans. It means that we can <laughs> you can build um, on, on waterways without having to go for a permit or a federal oversight. And it means that also pipelines are now directly exempted from the law. This is one of the oldest pieces of legislation. It's been around since 1882. Um, I, could, uh, I admit it might be due for an upgrade, but this was a very drastic um, reduction in the protection of our, our waterways. So what is needed? I'm not going to belabor our work. If you're interested in some of the background and the context, as well as the analysis around the pieces of legislation, have a look at our report. It's available on, on the website there. But we are really encouraging uh, a focus on the big picture, which we think is actually what wetlands and peatlands need. We're also uh, focused on trying to address this issue of cumulative impacts. Uh, the conversation around thresholds and limits to development needs to come forward in our conversations about conservation in the far north. We are not very happy about the Far North Land Use Strategy as an organization and provided public comments on how this needs to be refocused um, to something that an actually integrates and anticipates in a proactive way the kinds of impacts that we're going to be dealing with. It mentions wetlands two or three times in the whole document. Um, it has no understanding or uh, reference to ecosystem services, um, and it doesn't recognize them as unique ecosystems that require a different approach to planning than what we're pulling together right now. So I'll just wrap this up by saying there are still there are opportunities to, to do things differently in the far north. Um, we've learned a lot from southern systems where there's really strong policy and protection around wetlands, for example, in the south. There's a real sense that we don't want to duplicate what's happening in the south in the far north. And as a result, we need to find ways to uh, change or affect some of these planning, ugh, planning processes so that we're actually considering some of these world-class and important ecosystems. I encourage you to go on the Environmental Bill of Rights registry and look up this number and follow what's happening around the Far North Land Use Strategy if you're interested in, in that, that scope. That's the place where public are invited to put their comments forward about what's happening around peatlands and wetlands in particular. And I also encourage you to look at what Ontario is doing with respect to climate change and adaptation planning. These peatlands and the far north in particular are being promoted as, as climate regulation systems, as carbon storehouses, and yet there's no explicit um, action items around conservation of these systems. And finally, the last thing I want to mention that was clear from the far north land use strategy or far north uh, science panel report is maybe unlike systems in the south, trying to restore um, large subarctic wetlands and peatlands in the far north, excuse me, as a, as a mitigation to land use development is probably impossible. These impacts are going to be there forever. Um, and I think it's very short-sighted to think that we can just develop and mitigate against peatland and wetland destruction in the far north, even if it seems like we have massive systems, we've got lots of things that could go on there before things get, that get really bad. I'd argue that we need a more proactive approach to thinking about these systems now as opposed to later once development has already 
um, been approved and, and moving ahead in those systems. And that's all I have to say. Um, my email's not very clear there, but if you go on our organization line, if you're interested in talking to me further, I'm happy to chat. Thank you. Not everybody's depressed now. <laughs> uh, actually, I uh, had a question. Uh, the, um, especially, there's a lot of talk now, nowadays about integrating uh, Aboriginal or First Nations knowledge into the, the scientific process of looking at these systems. Uh, do you have any comments on, on that particular issue? Sure. So, yes. Um, so science has been working in these landscapes maybe since the 1960s, but there are First Nation uh, elders and uh, systems that have been living there for have a hundred years worth of knowledge, if not more. Um, so there's a wealth of information in communities about change, in particular around climate, but also around ideas about how to look after this land and take care of that land. Um, there are some avenues for sort of inviting that commentary and that information into planning processes. My experience has been that it tends to be, you know, we come with our reports and our scientific uh, subheadings and then where the traditional knowledge makes sense it gets fitted into some of those subheadings. Ideally in the land use planning processes that are unfolding traditional knowledge and traditional ways of looking after the land should be driving some of the thinking about land use planning. Um, whether that's actually happening, I'd say it's a bit mixed. There's certainly, at the federal level, um, we have commitments under the Convention of Biodiversity to include traditional knowledge in, in our, and monitoring and, how, and measuring how we're actually doing that to you know, report back to our commitments under that convention. I think it's very difficult, it's very mixed. There's a lot of trust issues around sharing that information. Um, and there is a lot of you know, cultural differences um, as scientists, we come in and think we can do a, a research project for a few years and we'll have some answers about what's happening there. And it often doesn't conform or agree with the people that have been living there for a long time. There's a real challenge around sort of imposing our worldview on what's happening. And so even being as, as a scientist and working in those systems, just having the space to listen to some of those different ideas and think about how do I do research differently? How do I, how do I engage people? How do I build relationships that support, you know, different ways of knowing, different systems of knowledge? Because I think ultimately it's it's both. We need both. We can't deal with, you know, regulatory systems just on traditional knowledge. We need the science piece um, because we've created those systems. But at the same time, there's a lot of traditional knowledge that. Um, just because of a history of lack of trust and, and inability to build a relationship that hasn't been, hasn't been documented, taken up. Um, I think we do need something a little bit different in the final. Questions, comments? I have a question uh, regarding your, <coughs> excuse me, any issue happens? I'm, I'm suffering from a uh, issue, so I'll do the best I can. Uh, what has been your success in, the, in uh, the communication side of this? How have you felt uh, that the First Nations in the North have an understanding of the long-term impact of what chromium coming to the surface in quantities with tailings will actually be like? Where, where, where are they accepting of the scientific uh, component of the mining endeavor in terms of what it does in the long-term to the landscape and the off-site environmental impacts. Um, is, there a, is there a way in which that information, in your estimation, has been provided in an acceptable manner? So I think contaminants in the north are a huge concern. First Nations in particular, and in the Arctic, this is very true of mercury, um, very true of a number of contaminants that are being mobilized in the environment because we're, we're changing land use. So there, there is real fear around what, what will these mining processes, what will these new changes to land use bring to people. There's also an, a really important component of human health. Um, most of these communities are subsistence communities. They're still relying on the food, the country foods from that landscape. They want to know that fish are safe to eat, and yet we've already 
We produce a, a guideline every two years that say, here's how much fish you're allowed to eat because the mercury contamination is, is high enough that it's of concern to women and children in, in particular. So the conversation around contaminants is a significant concern and it drives a lot of the, con I think, a lot of the pushback to, yes, let's just bring in these mining companies and we're going to have lots of money and it will be a great, I'm, I'm generalizing here, but um, those are the conversations, you hear a lot about concern about impacts, you hear a lot about the concern for future generations. It's this real difficult dilemma between providing for a growing population that wants jobs with you know, the risk of bringing these, inviting this industrial development in which will have impacts on everything from their traditional economies to even how they manage their communities right now. I think that challenge, the challenge in the EAs in particular, we're looking at a thousand pages of scientific technical management material. I have a PhD, it takes me a week to get through this material, let alone understand what chromite six might mean or what the mercury models will be for the watershed versus around the, the mine itself. These are very technical scientific documents and unfortunately there is not a good communications process to First Nations, which is why I think they get marginalized a lot. Um, we've heard conversations about people using the EA documents in, in, in First Nation offices as doorstops. No one's going to sit and read through that material, let alone be able to make intelligent, justified uh, decisions about saying yes or no to these projects. So it's, and that's ubiquitous, I think, across Canada. It's not just something that's unfolding in the far north. And there's been some really good research on the social side about why that is and how it needs to change. Thank you very much. We need to move on, but this was a great informative talk. Thank you.